as I mentioned, we've got some very exciting things happening today. Um, and we're going to start with, as you can see from the screen, looking at multi-purpose community centers within area-based approaches. And I'm going to hand over to Giovanna and Annika, who are co-leads of the ABA Working Group. So Giovanna, take it from here. Thanks a lot, uh, Charlie, and uh, welcome, everybody. And thanks a lot for joining us uh, today. Uh, at the CCM uh, retreat last year, uh, many CCM practitioners um, expressed uh, uh, the need to want to know more about uh, how to manage uh, community centers as a modality to deliver CCM activities uh, um, in ABA, or in Arab based approach, or in outside of camps. So we will take this opportunity today to um, share some guidance on managing community center, but most importantly, to listen uh, uh, to uh, some CCM uh, uh, practitioners. And uh, uh, let me immediately give uh, words to them so that they can introduce themselves. Uh, Christine, uh, shall we start with you? Sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Christine Westheim and uh, I work with NRC in supporting community coordination globally. I'm based in Tunis. Hi, my name is Henry. I am the Camp Management project Coordinator with NRC Nigeria. I'm working on mobile CCCM and out of camp. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sixteen. I am working in Burkina for ACTED, and I am the CCCM coordinator there. Thanks. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is Namir Osama, the camp management specialist working in Afghanistan on urban displacement out of camp and mobile site management. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christine, Harry, 16 and Namir. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, before uh, giving the words to our speakers, actually we would like to hear from you. So we would like to hear from you if you have been involved in CCM activities in non-camp setting. So uh, please go to menti.com and use the code uh, on the top of the screen. I think by now we are all uh, pro in using Menti after uh, four days of the retreat. And let us know if uh, uh, you don't have maybe experience in CCM activities, but you are curious to know more about it. If you have experience experience in context or uh, if you have experience in multiple contexts. So, um, yeah. So please get to Menti, use the code. I'm waiting for a, a bit more people to, to answer so we can have a look at how the participants of today are engaged in this topic already, or if they want to know more. The more of you answer, the bigger the donut gets. And who doesn't like a big donut? So the, uh, Charlie, the, the number of people that are voting is the, the, the number on the, the screen on the right side. Of That's right, that little little symbol in the bottom right hand side. So we have 30 people, 32, and they're still coming. So people are joining. Okay, good. So let's wait a couple of more seconds. Uh, okay. Okay, so, but I mean, people, they can still uh, uh, vote if they want. So, I mean, I think it's, um, we have a, a group of people that uh, um, uh, does not uh, have experience, but is curious, which is, uh, which is great. We will have also some uh, uh, fresh perspective in the discussion. <clears throat> we have, uh, uh, yeah, a, a good numbers that they have experience in working in CCM in non-camp setting in one context, so context-specific experience and also uh, that have experience in multiple contexts. I mean, the, the three groups that are quite uh, equal, there are slight uh, differences, but uh, um, yeah, I think it's the right mix of uh, people for this session um, to make sure that we are all on the same page so that we have all the same background uh, um, 
to this discussion, uh, let's have a look together at the CCM timeline related to the ABA out of camps discussion and development. So um, for those of you that already attended previous retreat or maybe uh, participated in our uh, CCM Tuesday, uh, maybe this timeline, uh, it's, a, it's familiar. You, have, it's, you, you saw them already um, once or maybe even more than once. Um, so as you can see, um, this is a not a new discussion. It's not something new uh, uh, on the table. This journey uh, started uh, 10 years ago, actually, at, uh, at uh, uh, the CCM Global Retreat in 2011, uh, when uh, CCM practitioner uh, highlighted the need to have uh, some common guidance uh, to use when uh, working um, in contexts uh, where maybe there, maybe there was a camp response, but CCM practitioners were engaged uh, in different uh, activities outside the boundaries of the camps. So uh, this is a, uh, so back 10 years ago, this generated uh, uh, an internal analysis of CCM practice and expertise uh, that uh, uh, could be applicable, adaptable to address the needs of uh, uh, displaced community um, living outside of camps and in, par in particular in urban uh, environment. Uh, this uh, analysis and reflection involved many uh, CCM practitioner, uh, many CCM agency, and were summarized uh, into the UDOC desk review, the, the green books. Uh, some of you, I, I'm guessing, might be familiar with it. I think in the, while I'm talking, uh, this will be the link uh, to the desk review will be posted. UDOC stands for Urban Displacement Outside of Camps. Um, in this desk review, uh, there was already the recommendation to use community center as a modality to deliver uh, CCM activities in non-camp setting. Uh, in particular, around uh, um, in particular activities around community engagement, communication with community, coordination. Uh, at that time, was um, was just an idea. Um, it was based on some um, on some uh, uh, experience already going on at that time, uh, but somehow was still a bit general, a bit abstract. So from 2015 onwards, uh, this idea of uh, um, this multi-purpose community hub uh, inspired uh, different pilots uh, in uh, several countries, uh, piloted by different uh, CCM agency, and uh, also with uh, a different implementation modality based on the context. So for example, we had uh, um, uh, piloting in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Greece, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Burkina. So really, uh, in the last uh, uh, five years, we had the piloting in several contexts. And this also led to a collection of uh, case study. So along with this field experience, I think every year since 2011 at the CCM annual meeting, we had a session, a discussion around the Arab base, around working outside of uh, camps. So we continue this uh, uh, dialogue between practitioners around uh, learning uh, challenges, experiences. And in 2018, uh, we uh, form an internal uh, global uh, working group on Arab base and outside of camps work. Uh, as a result of uh, the effort of this uh, working group, we developed the guidance on the CCM moda mobile modality. And in 2020, we launched the CCM paper on Arab base approach. So uh, again, in the chat, you will find the link to all this reference. Uh, there is also a recording of the launch uh, of uh, the CCM area based um, approach. Um, Annika, if we can move to the other slides. Okay. So in the, uh, in the uh, ABA paper, the one that we launched in April, uh, we uh, indicated different modalities to work, uh, to deliver CCM uh, uh, activities in a non-camp setting. So uh, one is the neighborhood committee. So establishing, establishing and supporting uh, community representation structures 
um, like we would do in a camps, but in a context where we have a, um, a, a neighborhood. Uh, outreach team, so this is a modality that resembles a bit the mobile uh, uh, CCM um, approach, and then community centers. In the reality, often these three modalities, they are merged together, they are integrated together. Uh, but we identify this as the main uh, uh, modalities tested so far to uh, deliver CCM activities in a defined geographical areas, which is uh, an area that is not a camp, is not a site, but is, for example, an urban uh, neighborhood. Um, if we go back <clears throat> one moment to the timeline, thanks, Annika. Um, in 2020, uh, so there is another uh, reference that is important for the discussion of today. So in 2020, we uh, also launched the Community Coordination Toolbox. So um, uh, NRC, with the support of IUN, uh, consolidated in this online uh, toolbox um, a number of, uh, a really large number of tools and guidance developed over several years and tested in multiple countries on how to engage uh, um, with communities when we don't work in camps, when we don't work in sites, but when we work uh, in, um, in, a, in a context where uh, the displaced community lives within the host community. Um, these, uh, these tools and guidance, of course, they are based on uh, our practice and experience of working um, on engaging with communities in camps, uh, but they were um, adapted, further developed for this specific uh, context. And this toolbox, just to add uh, one more thing, has also a particular focus on how to engage with women and marginalized uh, groups. So in the practitioner days on Monday, if you have more interest, of course, there is the link uh, in the chat. So if you want to uh, visit the, the community coordination toolbox, then on Monday in the practitioner days, uh, there will be a, a presentation of the outline of the toolbox. If you want to know more about uh, uh, the general structure and what there is inside. But for today, we would like to uh, share with you uh, a part of this toolbox. Um, that relates to the guidance and tools that we have um, that have been consolidating during the last months uh, around managing community centers. So these guidance and tools they are not uh, um, new. They've been uh, uh, they've been developed based on the experience of uh, several years now and in several contexts. Um, they will be formally integrated in the in the community coordination toolbox in September. At the moment, it's still a working process. Uh, so, of course, uh, also uh, any comments, input, contribution um, in the session of today or later on, uh, they would be most welcome. And so since we have uh, Kristin uh, here with us, Kristin is the person that have be, has been leading the development uh, of uh, the community coordination toolbox in the last uh, 18 months. So I would like to share with us, uh, uh, to give us a, a preview of this uh, guidance on managing a, a community uh, center that uh, you know, we are trying to, we are actually in the, the process of finalizing uh, in these uh, weeks. So, Kristin, I hand over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just dive directly into um, into uh, this this new chapter on um, community centers, um, and uh, explain a bit this diagram here, uh, because in this process um, of um, consultation with all the the different NRC offices. Um, who have tested and, and experiences with the tools, we decided to organize the tools a bit into the four main phases of this uh, community center management cycle. So in um, uh, pre-existing conditions for um, even starting to plan a community center, that's uh, the assumptions of elements that should ideally already be in place. Um, the planning of the community center and the actual management phase, and then the fourth phase being the handing over of the community center. Um, and I want to introduce you briefly to um, the tools that we will have available for each of these 
key steps that fall into these um, uh, four phases. So if you can go to the next slide, please, Annika. So for this um, um, pre-planning conditions, this phase here, um, I want to just point out that um, if you have all these conditions in place, um, your planning will be definitely much easier. Um, um, if you already have the presence created and build trust in, in the area, if you, if you have funding identified and, and ideally secured, um, if your staff is already trained in CCCM or in camp management or in, in new doc approaches, um, and also if you have uh, committees or focal points that you are working with in the area, it will definitely make the rest of the community management, um, uh, the community center management process easier, but it can also be done at any point during the process. Um, um, this, all the, all the key steps that you saw in this diagram in the four phases, um, they, um, uh, they don't have to be followed religiously and they don't have to all be um, conducted and implemented. This, this is all here as a guidance of what can potentially help you through the different phases of uh, community center management. So if you go to the next slide again, please. Um, um, in the planning phase, um, we identified the key steps as uh, uh, service mapping and also mapping the coordination mechanisms in the area, um, recruiting and training team members if they haven't already been, um, uh, if you're not using existing team members and they haven't already been trained, um, to conduct participatory community assessment. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this in, uh, in the next slide. Uh, to conduct area and uh, neighborhood mapping and identify the location and the building for the community center. So to demystify this a little bit, um, if you can go to the next slide, um, these tools that we, we will um, have in the chapter, um, some of them exist already, like the uh, staff training modules. We do have some staff training modules already there um, in the three languages of the toolbox, so English, French, and Arabic, on, like um, Giovanna was saying, how to do, how to promote community participation outside of camp settings. Um, so, um, in uh, how accountability and participation are linked in coordination and uh, information management in stakeholder mapping and analysis in training and facilitation and in how to work with and uh, potentially establish community structures so committees but we we will be adding one um, training module um, on you on uh, uh, on community center management. So on all of this, the key steps and, and uh, tools. Um, the participatory community, oh, sorry. If you can go back a little bit, I want to explain this participatory community assessment because it may sound a bit lofty, but it's very practical, really, the tools. Um, you can see a sample of, of one of them here is really just um, guidance and um, session plans for how to do focus group discussions or um, surveys with the host and displaced community members, uh, with service providers and local authorities, um, asking them questions on existing services, um, how much they participate in the service provision and design, um, existing community representation, um, relationship between host community and displaced community, etc. And also some guidance on how to identify survey um, um, respondents and um, uh, and then how to use this input um, on um, doing a gap analysis of the services. Um, and the area neighborhood mapping um, process is also, the tools are also similarly very simply broken down. It's a transect walk checklist, it's neighborhood uh, selection guidance and checklist. Um, there's a building and location checklist and also center selection scoring sheet. Um, they're, um, um, they are, you're, you're nodding them here, you know these tools very well, don't you? <laughs> um, um, 
they are either Word or, or PowerPoint or Excel um, uh, formats. So you can easily adapt them as you should for your context. Um, so um, uh, it's generally just guidance for what you could include uh, and why. Um, and then if you can go to the next slide, um, we'll talk a bit about the, the management phase. Um, so it's really important to continue to engage the community in, um, in the design and implementation of the activities. What do they want them to look like? What, what do they uh, want the schedule to look like? Um, uh, and uh, what do they want you and the other agencies that might be implementing activities uh, to prioritize, etc. cetera. Um, um, if you can go to the next slide, I will uh, go a bit more. Um, I'll give you some examples of typical center activities. Um, again, these are just examples and we've broken them into um, the three different work areas for a, a camp management agency. Um, so communication with communities, community engagement and support to coordination. Um, I'm not gonna mention all the examples um, and I'm sure that the, the other panelists can give you a lot more examples of different activities. Um, but for example, on the communication with communities it can be um, providing leaflets, uh, posters and brochures on the services that are available in the area. Um, on the community engagement, uh, can be supporting existing or establishing new feedback and response mechanisms and informing about it. And on the support to coordination, um, it um, can be training the community members to, to make safe referrals and also to, to support in making these referrals. Um, and uh, the tools that we have, if you want to go to the next slide, um, for this phase, it includes a guidance and checklist for how to develop participatory ME, um, guidance for how to develop community center SOPs, so standard operating procedures, um, MOU template that might be useful for agreements with other agencies that implement activities in the center. And um, there are some samples of um, how to introduce the community center when you launch the opening and um, and uh, also activity schedules uh, from how it's been done in other countries. And uh, similarly, on the implementation step, we'll have some um, uh, best practices for how different agencies and different countries have managed during um, a community center during COVID, as well as uh, staff uh, learning needs assessment template. Um, yeah, you can move on. Thank you. So the last phase, um, this should be planned for um, before the actual exit, of course. Um, and I think the other panelists will speak more about this uh, process. But if you go to the next slide, I can directly introduce you to the, the tools that we have. Um, so these tools, Again, there are guidance um, for how to plan and conduct the handover phase uh, in a safe and responsible way before you have to exit. Um, so how to um, do a local partner mapping. There's a, an assessment template for how to uh, start identifying the um, potential other actors that might be interested in, um, in taking over the management. Um, there's an exit checklist and there's also a, a handover roadmap for how to move this um, sometimes difficult phase of uh, handing over to, uh, to a local actor. Um, that is in brief, uh, all the tools that will be in the new chapter. Um, and uh, I think I am handing back to Annika and Jovan at this point. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you for this great presentation. Um, thank you for taking us through um, these new guidance and tools, which are uh, soon, I hope, to be available. I think I understood from, from, from September or end of the year, they will be part of the community toolbox website for everybody to see. And um, I think we have pasted in this uh, 
uh, uh, coordination toolbox website also in the chat. But it was also mentioned already in the uh, participation um, presentation we had on Tuesday. So thanks very much. And um, as Giovanna also said, yeah, most of these tools and guidance have come from, from learning and experience in the field. And, and because of that, we are so very glad to have our four speakers here today because they have all really substantially contributed or four, three speakers, Kirsten, I've included you as the speaker. Um, into our um, invited guests because I think they can really contribute um, to our discussion. So welcome, Sixteen Namia and uh, Henry. It's really nice of you to make time to be here today, and um, you know to talk us through really the practicalities of how you are working with displaced community um, and using the community center. And we want to really have a really practical conversation about how that happens in Burkina Faso, in Nigeria, and in Afghanistan. And we will also have some, I think, uh, some input from Iraq, um, from our speakers. So um, we want to be really practical. And um, to do that, we have the speakers prepare a little presentation, just a very short one, so that we all get kind of a little bit of a background of the context and uh, the type of community centers and activities uh, and structure, you know, the actual place um, where they sit, the area where they're located. So then we can have, a, um, um, I think, a better informed discussion. And afterwards, we have time, um, we have quite a bit of time for um, uh, your thoughts and our thoughts. And what we really hope to do is to ask lots of really good questions to our invited guests and have a, a good discussion between Giovanna, me, and all of you here in the room and our speakers. And um, we have prepared lots of questions, we could have many. Um, so I hope you too, and um, please put them into the chat anytime. Um, we will monitor them. And um, so without any further Adieu. Henry, are you are you happy to talk about Nigeria? Yes, I'm quite ready. I'm happy. Oh, I can't move my slide. Sorry, my PowerPoint is stuck. Henry, just start talking. I'll get there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all. <laughs> so, uh, for Nigeria, this displacement has actually been a protracted displacement. Started in 20, 2014, earlier, some people could say 2011. So, we've been faced with a protracted crisis, which is partly humanitarian and natural disaster. So, we have, we have over 500,000 displaced in, internally in Meduguri. And 65% of this actually in IDP camps. The rest are in out of camp. Actually, we have quite a lot of people out of camp. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sorry. Good. So, Northeast Nigeria, we have in the whole context in the four, in the three base states, Borno, Adamo, and Yola, and Yobe, we have 1.2 million people, 1.9 million IDPs. We have 257,000 Cameroon and Chad, which are cross-border refugees. We have 54% 50, of these IDPs living in host communities. This is quite a lot, large number of IDPs, mostly in these three states, Borno, Adamo, and Yobe states. And in Borno states, mostly we have only 74 sites. Part of these sites have no access to funding and gap issues. And then 81% of these IDPs are approximately are staying in Borno states. That's 54% of IDPs across all these locations are in Borno states, a very large number in Borno states. Right now, we have 81,000 newly displaced. It is pushing to close camps. We are still having people arrive in, Burn in Medjugorje. Previously, last week, we, if the governor closed camps, moving IDPs back to their host community. We had 
2,000 host community or households move back to their communities of displacement. Even though we do not have security, people are complaining and areas of origin. And we are having secondary displacements coming back because when they return, they are attacked by insurgents and they have to return back to the communities. Next slide. Sorry, Next slide. we have the same problem. Okay, so let me just continue. So right now, in this context, we are forced to, to discuss about durable solutions, talk about how do we engage the government in having meaningful durable solutions? Because if we have to return these people, these, communities, these IDP communities to their origins of displacement, we have to have it in a durable solution. The government is sticking to their point of returning communities. So in NRC, we are having two types of response. We have the mobile response and the out-of-camp response. This is the picture for the out-of-camp. Our strategy is 50 informal and formal sites for, out of, for mobile response. And then the EDOC approach where we are working in 12 urban neighborhoods in Bolo Ritu, reaching 35,000 IDPs. We have the community center, which is currently in the rehabilitation phase. In the, we are working on setting up the UDOC center. I think by the first week of July, we would have opened the UDOC center. We would provide site, site improvements and cash for work. We would have support to coordination mechanism, engaging local stakeholders, communication with community. Right now, what we are doing is awareness. We are raising awareness through communication with communities. We are doing COVID-19 awareness sessions, trying to bring out the buy-in from the community because without the community leaders, you could not have a successful program, programming. Next slide. So in the community center, right now we have several partners willing to engage us. We have PUI, SCI, we have ACF, NRC, other departments and government agencies and national NGOs, which we are right now in coordination face with them, trying to see what services they could provide. Some partners have, have shown interest to provide certain services. Some partners said do not have capacity, but would actually want to be informed and kept abreast of what is happening in the center. Activities having the information session, which ICLA is showing interest to attend. We are having space coordination meetings. Right? We are having coordination with other partners and maternal agencies and IDP communities and host communities too. We have a space for livelihood, specifically for women and girls, because in this context, we women are actually left behind. Women are actually marginalized. We have so many barriers limiting women participation. So we thought it's wise to actually engage women, increasing their level of participation through livelihood activities. Then, right, we are currently in the preparation stage. We are preparing to actually conduct several activities. What we've done so far, three community assessments. We have raised awareness on the importance of UDOC and how it will work with the community, local government structures and how it will actually seek to improve coordination between host community and IDP community, community really building social cohesion. Then establishing community outreach center uh, groups, uh, mobile team. As Giovanna said, we have a mobile team in the UDOC approach where they go for outreach activities on a daily basis, trying to reach all these stress settlements. Next slide. Basically, I think that's, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. And uh, sorry for my problems with sharing the screen. So we've just uh, uh, given it to somebody else. Uh, Abhi Jabo share the screen. So I hope we won't have the problem next one. Thanks, Henry. And um, I could hear that you sometimes were breaking off a little bit. So maybe later on in our discussion, you you maybe can elaborate on some of the points a bit um, so we can um, hear you well. But uh, 16, uh, would you mind uh, continuing and talking about Burkina Faso and your program there? Next slide, please. Yeah. Sure, thanks, Anika. Thank you. So to give a bit of context, in Burkina, CCCM is very, very new because the first project started more or less a year ago. 
So to give a bit of context, um, there is more or less 1.2 million IDP in country. Um, as you can see kind of on the top map, it's mainly um, in the area of the three borders region, that is Mali on the north, you have Burkina and then Niger on the east part. Um, and just to give you an idea, this 1.2 million IDPs, it's twice more than same time last year. Um, so it's increasing very, very fast. Um, the reason is mainly that there are repetitive attacks on village um, that have fostered waves of displacement. At first, it was mainly reactive displacement, so after attacks. And now what we're seeing is we have a lot of uh, preventive displacement um, to basically yeah, to, to, to quit the village be before uh, being attacked by armed groups. Um, so the northern and the eastern region as you can see on the map, um, are the most affected. But we are starting to see that this uh, situation is spreading over the country, um, including the south and the southwest uh, region. So we are, yeah, we are seeing a phenomenon of, of um, IDPs moving across the country um, everywhere now. So the displacement is mainly urban. Uh, that's the, the high majority. We don't have very very clear figures about it um, but but we know it's mainly urban so in the host families or uh, rented or lent land where people settle and build their own shelter and we also have informal sites that are mainly urban or peri-urban um, you have like one formal site that is being built at the moment uh, but fairly small so mainly urban and informal next slide please Thanks. About the strategy, so for now, uh, what we're doing is we're doing so urban CCCM and uh, mobile teams in uh, in informal sites. So we are trying to cover the most affected areas, so mainly um, the the eastern region and the north and kind of center region. In urban areas, we have community centers that the first top photos, uh, the like hard community center. Um, the objective is really to foster social cohesion between host and displaced population. Globally, there was not a lot of issues at the beginning, but now that all infrastructure are really under pressure, it's starting to create tensions uh, between communities. So that's one of the goal of the center. Um, to create this social cohesion, strengthen, of course, access to information. On the center, you can see a banner that is basically the images we use for uh, hygiene sensitization that we put there again um, to, so population can have access to it at any time. And also reinforce community engagement. I will talk about it a bit later, but our center are being managed by committees that are, um, of course, female and male, but also host and displaced communities together. Just for the context, the bottom photo is a non like semi-durable center, let's say, that we put for um, informal sites that are either very small or uh, in a private land. So we can take them away after, after leaving if necessary. It's important also to mention that the government has a very key role in Burkina regarding CCCM because they do the site administration, of course, but they also do management and uh, the CCCM actors only support them in managing the sites. Yeah, if we can move to the next slide. Otherwise, okay, great, thanks. So for the community centers, to give you an idea, we have 21 at the moment. Um, so both types are uh, durable and like say semi-durables. Um, the type will depend on the size, but mainly on the ownership of the land. We will never build a durable center if the ownership is not uh, by the city. Um, and of course we have an agreed, uh, an agreement regarding the use of the center before building or installing them. So one thing um, maybe that is a bit different than what Christine showed before is that our centers are directly handed over um, to the uh, authorities for the use of the committee. So it's, uh, it's part of the buy-in, it's part of the agreement and the negotiation to have these centers. So basically the, the mayor or the city hall becomes 
the owner of the center, but there is an agreement clearly standing that it's for the use of the community and the committee is in charge of managing it with the support for now at least of ACTED. Um, and what type of activity we do there? So of course, all our CCCM activities are in the center, uh, but which is great. We're starting to have other humanitarian and uh, governmental actors using the community, the committee, the sorry, the centers <laughs> to do the activities with the, com the communities. And we also have the communities using the center by themselves for gathering general assemblies, but completely beyond any organization or structure just they really um, kind of yeah use it on their own yep i think that's it for burkina thanks a lot yes coming to afghanistan perfect thanks for taking turning taking over so quickly <laughs> okay so <laughs> the context <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the context in Afghanistan, it's a little bit complex. We have 40 years of war till now, and it's more than 40 years of war till now. And according to the latest report that we have, we have more than 18 million still in dire need for assistance. Uh, the context in Afghanistan, in addition, adding to the uh, conflict, the war situation, we have some natural hazards. We have earthquakes, droughts uh adding to all of this the situation of COVID now so we have a lot of people also adding to the previous uh factors the COVID factor so uh now we are witnessing an increasing of armed conflict again uh, that's why we are on the news all the day and the uh, displacement became a survival mode uh, for the people here, like whatever, like when, whatever happened in a certain area, the people, the first option they they will do is to be displaced uh, to another area. So a lot of people they took it as a way to survive. Uh, now, for two generations, uh, they never witnessed like uh, peaceful days or uh, a calm uh, situation in this country. Uh, so the strategy for the camp management here. Uh, we are working in informal and scattered sites with mobile site management. We have all the mobile site management activities. Also, we are working in urban uh, areas uh, in, in addition to the sites. Uh, and we have eight community centers in different locations. And we are trying to extend to cover other locations. We have two other centers to uh, cover other locations. So. We are targeting mainly IDPs. We have also uh, returnees, refugees. Uh, so because because of the context happening and in, in also in uh, the surrounding countries, a lot of people are coming to Afghanistan or returning to Afghanistan. Uh, also, because of the situation of uh, the constant war and the context, like the contents, uh, the con since uh, the uh, the ongoing conflict, uh, there is a lot of protected displacements. Those people they don't have a plan to return to the area of origin. Uh, also, they cannot be resettled other places, and we are also facing some difficulties in, in making them uh, integrated in, in in this area or uh, to be merged with this, with the area of displacement. Uh, for the community centers. Uh, I will talk about the managing and the handover of the community centers. So managing the community center, usually we are saying it's a living process uh, because there was there will be always a constant changes on the activities. Uh, and there are main points that we are sticking with, which is we have the schedules, we have uh, the standardized like the standards of each activities, but usually the activities it's not one activity will go till the end because the activities it's changing based on the community request or based on the context changing. So what should be in a place? Uh, it should be like capacitated staff who are well known about the rules and responsibilities uh, from programmatic perspective and also from operational perspective. We should have a good communication tools between us and the community so we can receive the information and also we can disseminate it. So it's a living process between us and the communities. And the service mapping, of course, we will have the community centers, we will have the outreach teams, but 
we need to have every like we need to know every service uh, in the area what we are doing like what the other partners are doing uh, and how we can communicate this information to the community. And also, the, as we mentioned, we have a lot of like changes with the activities. So we need to have a clear activity schedule. So the people, they should know when to come, what the services that we are provided, what the activities that we are providing. And also we need to communicate this with other partners uh, within the area. And partners, I don't just mean NGOs, maybe it's local uh, governmental bodies, maybe it's uh, volunteers, maybe they are just the community. So, and uh, always, as long as we have activities ongoing, we need to have an operational, operational tools to track our uh, consumables. Uh, and track our needs like for the activities. If we need a space, we need chairs, we need refreshments, we need stationery, all of this should be in a place. So yes, that's it from my side, hand over to you. Thank you, Namia, thank you very much. And I think you can stop sharing the screen because we are not at the end of the session yet. <laughs> yes. So we, <laughs> we have time uh, for a discussion now. And thank you so much for you three going through your programs just to give us a, um, you know, a backdrop on uh, which way we can go into some more detail. And um, picking up on your last presentation, Amir, I thought it was really interesting how you described it as a living process. Um, and there is a living process, a continuous ongoing process with the community. And um, so, I maybe start off with the first question and, and taking this thought forward, um, Henry, maybe you can um, tell us a little bit how exactly did you engage the community in the initial phases, you know, in the planning, in the initial discussion, um, because I've also seen some questions about that in the chat. So Henry, over to you. Okay, thank you. Actually, like Christina said, we have so many tools actually we use for community engagement. But first of all, we actually had to do a stakeholders analysis and mapping to understand who are the stakeholders involved in this neighborhood, to understand who would have key interest and influence in your activities. So when we had this mapping, we identified various stakeholders to, to engage. In our context, uh, the government is really involved in, in our activities. So they are the first people you engage on in whatever you're doing. So we engage various level of government, the local authorities, NEMA, SEMA. Then we had several conversation with the community leaders. We had, in this context, this is in an urban setting, they had good structures. So it was easy for us to identify who are the leaders, who the leaders were. So we engaged them in several meetings with community leaders of both IDP and host community in this case, because we had to engage various groups. And we had meetings with women leaders, youth leaders, and every other identified groups to really discuss about what our plans were in the preparation phase. We told them this is what we wanted to do and if they would be interested, actually. And to me, you have to have a buy-in. To get a buy-in, you have to give something to get something. So we actually encouraged them, given that there would be a livelihood opportunity for the women and for the youth. Can you hear me, sorry? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So this gave them the interest, this brought the interest about the community center. When the women heard there was an opportunity for, for livelihood, there was an opportunity for to have a center for women, they were really interested. The men they wanted to actually engage us. So it was actually multiple layers. You have to have a multiple system of engaging people. Having the stakeholders analysis was very, really, really very helpful for us. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. And um, I, I wonder if I can just bounce the same question off to you, 16, to, to see, if, did you use similar ways of going about it or um, especially about the multi layers of kind of taking apart the community, not as a whole, but, you know, all the different, different groups of the community? Yeah, so I think for us it was slightly different um, because basically why we built the center at the beginning was that the community made it very clear they didn't have any space to meet and that was the big issue. So 
that's also why our center are so small. <laughs> um, we know that they're very tiny, so it's a very different type of centers. Um, I think what Christine described is more something I've seen in Iraq, where we have several colleagues in the conversation who manage them. Um, it's really smaller. At the beginning, it was really to have a place to meet for the community. So that's, that's the base for us. Um, and uh, so we discuss with them where we should basically put it because it had to be on communal land. Uh, so we could hand it over. And that was like a very strict condition uh, with the authorities. Um, and it has to be located in an area where communities could access. And it, it's not that simple because for example, one of our center that is built in, in a urban area, it has a catchment population of more than 30,000 person. Um, so it wasn't super easy to decide where to put it. So we had this discussion with uh, the community, but also to be frank with the, the, the communal authorities because it has to be on their land. So we had to deal, like to take that into account. So basically we cross um, the information we got from the, the communal authorities and then with the community and basically when we did this process of finding the place, we already had uh, a committee representing both host and displaced population in place. So we could kind of use them, discuss with them as representative of their community and the, the, the mayor office, and then decide where to put the center. So that's, that's basically how, how we set it up. And for the, for the use um, of the center, we really discuss with the community how they wanted to use it. But as I said before, the, the center belongs to them from the beginning. We built it and when we did the inauguration, we hand it over. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a bit different also maybe because it's smaller. Um, but yeah, it, it belonged to them already. So we, we support, but we don't decide basically. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting and I'm really happy to see, um, you know, the different facets which now come out in our discussion about what, you know, the term community center can all include. And, um, and um, you, you said two things, maybe we can also pick up later. One of them is about uh, the really simple question of where to place it, um, you know, where should it be, the center? And um, so, um, Amia, maybe I can um, hand over to you and ask you, you know, what, what were these challenges uh, you had to face when you had this question of where to put it, you know, how, how to facilitate access uh, to different vulnerable groups, to women or people with disabilities, or you had to, to, to choose what facilities this, this building, this place has to have. Maybe you can share a little bit with us. Yes, uh, we're always saying that it should be accessible and secured. But by you saying accessible, it doesn't mean that you can reach this uh, space. It's, it's not about just reaching this space. It's about the physical design also. Uh, if you have people with special needs, if you have, uh, like in the, in the planning phase, you will see in some context, they want to have like a female part, a male part. So it's also about how to select the design from the inputs that you have from the beginning of the, of the information collection of your community center. So, and also by saying secure, uh, there are many factors, like it's in some contexts, you need to have a lot of security security improvement in that physical space. In some contexts, you need to have it in a place that it's far away from the police station or a checkpoint or some armed group location. So there is a lot of factors that you need to consider from the beginning, from the planning phase to have. Also, there are some things that you cannot uh, expect from the beginning. As an example, in one of the contexts, we take into consideration all the parts of the accessibility and the security. But after a while, we received a lot of people. So the neighbors, they were upset about having a lot of people in this area. So this is also something that uh, we consider that it's accessible, but without doing any harm to uh, the, the surrounding areas. Also, there is other aspect like if you have a community center you think about like a place for the people to have a garage as an example or to have a, a parking space as an example or it should be like 
not like uh, like put the stairs uh, like if, if you are thinking about having a place or sessions for people with special needs you should think about having the ground space uh, for them so it's more accessible than having it on the second floor or the third floor so there are many aspects of of having or locating the community center but i'm, I'm uh, taking from my colleagues one of the things that it's it's for me, it's really important. Uh, the findings from the planning stage, it's not a handbook, let's say, because it's always changing. Uh, when you are establishing a community center, the people in the beginning, they have their perspective about this area, about this space. So after a while, it will start to change. And after having more uh, like understanding about how this space can be used. Over. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Navia. And um, Henry, I saw you nodding just now. I saw that you were kind of in agreement, especially about this part of this is really a, a living process. You know, it's not a fixed building with an activity, but it is it is a process that's continuously changing and the expectation maybe of the community themselves, but also the host community, different parts of the community. Do you have anything to add or you would like to add on this point? Yes, actually, uh, I agree strongly with Namir actually. In the, when we were designing this center in the beginning, we thought we would get a very big space that would accommodate everyone and everybody would be interested. But when we got to the field and start seeing, if we get the big spaces, we were not in good locations. You would get a good space in a very terrible location. You would get landlords wanting, wanting extra money. You would, so, so many factors on the ground. Accessibility, it was, it was this secured. We had in some locations, the community said they do not want to have uh, IDPs coming into this community, into this area. There was a mosque close by, they do not want too much traffic. It was really very difficult actually to balance, to get a building to was acceptable by the community of both the host community and the IDP and even the government itself. So it was really challenging. You have to really adapt as you go forward. We had to adopt a template, actually, the, the, neighbor, the, the Redox Center Selection Checklist. We had to really adapt that template because a lot of the criteria there were not actually applicable to our context. So you go to the field, you might have an idea in the office. When you go to the field, it's a different case scenario. So you have to really be really flexible when you are selecting a building. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. And, um... Giovanna, do do you have any questions coming in or do you have anything that you kind of collected during, during our discussion? Yeah, there, are, uh, um, there is some uh, good discussion going in the chat, uh, in particular around, uh, maybe this was uh, a bit uh, uh, in, um, you know, in the previous, in the regional conversation around uh, how we define uh, the area, the categories of, uh, uh, the community center. This is a direct link with the ABA uh, discussion around how we define this area. Uh, in the chat, that I'm mentioning like uh, using uh, administrative boundaries, uh, uh, um, but then also, you know, it is important to take in consideration the the, the geographical boundaries, uh, but then also the perception of uh, the community. And this is beside, uh, you know, the, the discussion, the broader discussion, the EBA, in terms of the community centers, it can be relevant uh, because, you know, defining the area is also linked uh, with, uh, you know, the local uh, service provision and also the, it's a humanitarian service provider. You know? it, it's very important that there is a, a consensus around this, um, yeah, this area. Um, yeah, and then, uh, um, yeah, there is also from Iraq that are uh, um, reporting some uh, uh, experience uh, uh, on, um, yeah, on this topic. Um, I was wondering if Arika can make questions to Henry. Um, uh, I was wondering, I mean, because in, in also the chat they're coming, uh, several reference to um, yeah, so the, to working with the local authorities. Uh, 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 so, from your uh, um, experience, Harry, um, 
do you how how the local authorities uh, actually understand community centers as uh, um, a place uh, uh, for exchange a place for dialogue between uh, 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 the community and uh, the community representative and themselves, so the community representative and the, the local authorities, and um, yeah, and a, a place for uh, for coordination, a place for coordinate different uh, different activities and different service. If you have any okay. yeah any example of how you uh, yeah you see the the, the local authority um, yeah seeing the, the our community centers. Okay, so in, in, in our context in Nigeria, actually, the, 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 the local authorities do not have capacity and they have low experience or understanding of CCCM or, or the, even the humanitarian response itself. So what we did was actually to really engage them in capacity building and training. Even we are really planning next month, in two weeks time, we are going to have a training with SEMA, NEMA and local authorities. And I am going to explain in detail, it's going to be a four days training. I would have one day to explain what we'll do in UDOC. And the UDOC center itself would be actually a key part, part of this. We, we had several meetings with the chairman and the LGA chairman, the, the, the NEMA, where we actually explained to them. They have so many questions. They are interested actually, but they do, they do not have the understanding of what we will do. When we talk about coordination, actually, they actually have, think it's going to be them being in charge of coordinating the material partners and actually directing who gets what. So we really had to train them on saying this, is, this space is for coordination for everybody, both, high, both host community, both IDP, both material partners, and even the government authorities. So it's really a work in progress to educate them and capacity them on this. Thank you so much, Henry. And um, uh, Giovanna, if you, um, I may pass this uh, same question on to 16, because um, what you mentioned earlier, that the first thing really for these community centers or the centers you build uh, was for the community to meet, right? That was in a way you described as your first step. But um, has it evolved or is it intended to evolve to also be a place for local coordination with between the service provider and community representative or the local authority, or is this already happening? How does that look in, in practice for you? Yeah, so as you said at the beginning, it was mainly for the community to meet and it has, which is nice, it has kind of evolved but it's by itself. So, um, so basically what happens concretely is that so for the humanitarian actors they came to talk to the uh, cccm mobile team and the committee to know if they could use the center for the activities so that they just basically saw the center we also like explained to to our partners that we built this center and and they simply asked if they could use it um and for the authorities, because they also provide part of the assistance in the food distribution. So they have also, because we involved them from the beginning in uh, choosing the area, they validated the design, um, they were with us during the building process and at the inauguration. So they are really well aware of the centers and they asked us if they could do their distribution in the center. Because basically what you saw is the center and then you have an extension that is covered um, so you can have like a larger group of population that can also wait during a distribution area with shade. So that that's, it kind of, yeah, that's how it went. It kind of evolved by itself. Um, to be frank, I'm currently rethinking our strategy for urban um, CCCM and uh, rethinking also, do we go to more like long-term community centers, more like what Christina was presenting which could be in some of our areas in Burkina interesting to implement. So I'm, I'm thinking about it and that's why it's also so great to hear from other people. But yeah, for us, it really, it really evolved by itself, I would say, yeah. Uh, that, that's really interesting. So I think we, we're hearing more and more the emphasis of this kind of um, small centers who kind of evolves and you're actually building extensions of how it evolves according to the program and the people who uses the activities that are happening. And um, so um, now we have, maybe I can go to you and, and ask you, so what exact, what are the exact activities 
you do it? You know, give us some examples. And, and who, who comes, you know, who, who, who comes and visits the centers? So mainly it's, uh, we always avoiding to have a pull factor everywhere, except for the community centers. The community center, it should be a pull factor for the people who are like trying to get services. Like when we are saying informal sites, we don't create pull factor. In the camps, we don't create pull factor. But for the community center, we are not uh, establishing a new displacement. We are serving the people. So how, like we should think how we create a pull factor for the people. So the first thing it's the community center, it's not uh, just for getting services. It's the people center. So it's maybe recreational activities. It's maybe uh, vocational activities. It's maybe just coming to print some papers. Like I remember in, in one of the centers, we have just some printers that the people can come, like if they have their essays, if they want to copy something, they can just come and copy it. Uh, we have a coffee machine outside. So the people, if you want to drink a coffee, you can just pass by to drink a coffee. And it maybe you will be interested to see like, this information that we have uh, on the first, like on the first entry of the center, maybe it will be interested for you. So you will ask further question. So you will know more information about how to get services. So uh, and like sometimes uh, in, in some, uh, in some uh, like uh, events, it was even in the weekend, uh, like some of the staff agreed to, okay, uh, some of the females, some of the males, they are, uh, employment uh, they are employees so they cannot come to the centers during our working time so what we're gonna do is uh, every three weeks we're gonna have the friday or the saturday uh, as a working day and uh, we can have some people uh, to come to the centers during the weekend and during the weekend it's not uh, sessions or trainings or no it's just enjoying maybe uh, have the internet and play PUBG as an example, anything. Uh, it's not about having 100% like vocational training or capacity building. It's about having the people, uh, having a space where the people are comfortable. In. Uh, I, I remember we had like ping pong table, we have uh, like a pool table also for the youth to come. And this is the recreational part for the vocational part. We are coordinating with all the partners and even internally to have maximum, like as maximum activities as we can. It's starting from how to write your CV, how to conduct an interview, and it's ended with uh, like your employment right uh, and uh, how, how to engage with the employees. And, uh, and sometimes it's technical training, how to fix uh, a block, how to do electricity, how to do painting. And we have volunteers from the community sometimes to like, this is a nice thing in the community center. Some people, they are volunteering to teach something. So uh, like we have some people, okay, I am good at mathematics. Uh, I, I have master in mathematics. So I can teach the students in this area, uh, uh, like for this, from this stage to this stage. So, okay, we are like, we love this. We're gonna uh, like disseminate the information. We're gonna have like a proper uh, introduction for the people about what we are doing. And we have a schedule after that to be shared and who want to register, they can register and we can start this activity. So there is no uh, like boundaries with the activities. It's just do no harm, keep our like the humanitarian policies and everything else, how to make the people in this area make the most benefit of their center. Well, I mean, I love the uh, coffee for CCCM and it's kind of taking on its life by itself here in the chat, which is, uh, which is really nice. So um, thank you, Namir. Um, I, I think you really, it's nice that you express it so clearly. And I see Giovanna, she wants to uh, jump in on that point too. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm not, uh, it's um, just to uh, um, report a bit from uh, the chat. There's been a good input from uh, uh, Gisele and Marion. Um, apologies if I'm not pronouncing well uh, your names. Um, so they were sharing experience about uh, uh, engaging uh, uh, local authority, government authority in the management of community centers. Um, 
uh, highlighting also that this could be sometimes challenging. Uh, and uh, um, on this, uh, just a, a thought, a reflection from my side, um, because in one side it's extremely important that uh, we engage uh, in this process, the local authorities, but then also we need, uh, I mean, to consider if, um, if a community center is managed by the, the, the local authority is then still uh, per perceived as a people center, as Namir uh, said, uh, because of course we, we know that, you know, the, the, the layer of complexity uh, and the dynamics within the community can be uh, multiple. And uh, on this note, I uh, would like to ask Kristin, so um, if in, uh, in, um, in the community coordination toolbox, we will uh, present, you know, this guidance for managing community centers as a community center as a safe space uh, uh, for uh, women and for um, vulnerable groups. Um, could you, Kristin, based on uh, on uh, uh, all the uh, best practice that you have been collecting in the last months uh, uh, from uh, 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 from our colleagues? Um, could you mention some example of um, yeah, activities uh, that can make uh, um, these uh, centers become like safe space for these uh, groups? Yeah, um, it might be actually uh, just repeating a bit what the others have said, because um, um, it's both about um, creating safe like physical spaces um, um, so for women in marginalized groups, sometimes that will include the location, but also um, if they would prefer to have a separate meeting place from, so them being, for example, women don't want to meet um, in the same spaces as men, maybe they would require a separate uh, entrance um, or to have a schedule so that they can um, come to the community center when there aren't um, any men meeting. And the same with marginalized groups. Um, and uh, uh, to have like simple things like uh, toilets for women, toilets for men, um, accessible um, toilets for those who have uh, physical disabilities. And then where are you placing them? So just continue to consult with all the different groups and what their needs are to make it a safe space. Um, it's very important not to have um, like to not assume that we know what they need, um, but to continue to ask them. Um, but it's also about um, uh, creating a safe space as uh, like for how they feel about going to the center. So for women, they it's not enough uh, to to ask them what kind of activities they would want to to um, access in the center, but also to create the, the um, acceptance among the often male leaders in the community um, and to really spend time and uh, build trust among the different groups and particularly the most influential um, and powerful people in the community to accept the fact that women will be going to the community center so that the women that go there feel safe. Like Namir was saying, you know, we don't want to do any harm and we just want to make sure that we have the, the buy-in from, from the men and also when it comes to women's activities um, so we don't put them at home. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. And um, um, 16, maybe I can um, direct, you know, the direction uh, towards you at the moment because um, what Giovanna said uh, earlier, if sometimes when the uh, community centers maybe get over, handed over or when there's this process of handing over, um, and because you mentioned that also the local authority is always very much involved and it has an ownership of the center, does that, do you feel that it creates some kind of reluctance of the community to go there? Do they feel less ownership themselves now because you know, it is actually the, the, the local authority who, who um, manage the place, or is that not something you are concerned about or hasn't, hasn't materialized yet? So, yeah, no, it hasn't, it hasn't materialized. We're not very worried on that aspect because, yes, the, the authorities own the place, 
but there is a written document. Well, I know this is not always sufficient. We all know that. Um, but there is a written document explaining that, yes, it belongs to them, but it's for the community and it's managed by the committee. Um, and to be frank, the authorities also, in some of the areas, there is not much humanitarian assistance. So they were very, very happy that we built this center. So they were extremely supportive in all the inauguration we did. We had lots of support from authorities and they always encourage the community and the committee to um, kind of own the center, to make it their own, to use it for what they need. So no, we haven't really faced it and it's not, I have worries, but it's not one of them. No, no, I think it's, we're going to be fine on the on this aspect for now. That's great. Um, I'm actually just I just saw the chat, Giovanna. There was something coming in on the last minute. Um, yes, there was a, a questions uh, uh, around uh, um, uh, what about uh, uh, for potential GBV cases? Who comes to the community for support and help? So I don't know if any of our um, uh, speakers has any um, example of experience on this and how did you manage? Namir, I see that you want to talk. Yes. Uh, usually these are sensitive cases like we are always facing in the field and what's coming in the field, it's coming in the community center. So what we had uh, done in this community center, we usually have uh, the basics, which is, it should be there. Like we have female staff, we have male staff. So in case if there is something like really sensitive, they can go to the male and the female staff. And also we have a lot of feedback and complaint mechanisms in a place. We have hotlines, we have boxes, we have everything. So for the GBV cases specifically, we had like, this is something I didn't mention in the beginning with the activities. I mentioned like uh, the nice, parts of the community center, how the people are coming. But also we have a lot of uh, activities going in the community center. Uh, we had a protection partners working in the community center. So in case we have this directly, we can, all the staff is uh, trained on safe referrals. All uh, the committees are trained on safe referrals. Also, everyone has uh, the PSAA trainings. So and uh, the first psychological aid training. So they can receive the case. They have the way to deal with it. There is a room always empty with, where the, like the person who received the case who can speak uh, like directly to the beneficiary who is raising this case. And then after the approval and the consent, it can be going directly to the protection partner. And usually we have a protection partner within the space or we have or we have them regularly like three days a week two days a week and always there is like a, a communication with the protection partners like if it's an urgent case they can send us the focal point directly to the center so we can manage this case directly and after referring that our responsibility is to follow up on these cases and sometimes because the center have multiple services, it's much easier for the protection partner after taking this case to refer to different partners because we have already everything in place. We have uh, uh, the like uh, service mapping, we have uh, the focal points. So it's much easier for the protection partner to go, go through the community center than like running this case by, by its own. Oh. Thanks, Samir. Um... As you just mentioned, you know, the community center also being, a, you know, a focal point where other service provider can um, offer their services or um, information sharing. Um, so in the very become like a, a, a hub within this area. Henry, did you, how did you convince the other service providers to, to come and use the centers or uh, did you need to convince them at all? Or was it for them actually, uh, um, you know, like a gift of saying of having a space within the urban environment to to reach people, or is this just a, an assumption? Okay, thank you, Anika. Actually, actually, I had to convince them. Actually, so you have to understand what is the, what is in it for these partners. Uh, as much as we say it is a space for coordination, space for information sharing, some partners really do, would want to see 
how would they benefit? Does it meet their target? Does it meet their indicators and co? So I try to sell it to them in the sense that, okay, we have so many traffic people coming in as a traffic here. You could be able to reach more people than you'd usually reach. When, when you go to when you go for outreaches and you go for door to door, you are looking for sheets, you are looking for you you, you rent tampolins and and chairs. I can't you come into the center where we have these facilities. We offered them the use of the structure, the use of the chairs, the, the tables, and public address systems, uh, the use of our, our community outreach teams. So when they saw it was easy for them to use the center, they came into the center. It was actually you have to coordinate, share a lot of information, speak with the, the management of each organization and see how you'd actually work together. Because when you meet the, the field staff on the field and they will say, okay, no, we can't do this until we get from our manager. So I had to have a lot of coordination mechanism. I actually went into as far as creating a, a WhatsApp group, a coordination group, and sh telling, sharing information on what we plan to do with the center. So it was much of actually trying to persuade them to use the center. Mm. Can I Thanks, jump in here? Please do, Nami, I was just <laughs> about you. to. <laughs> yes, uh, adding to my colleague, Henry, what, what he said, like there are two types of like added value for other partners uh, to be in the community center. There is the operational part, which is you already have the physical space. You already have everything organized there. There is a schedule. There is a coordination. Uh, there is like a lot of facilities that you can directly use. You have the data shows. You have the meeting rooms. You have the refreshments, the stationery. You just need to coordinate with the, with the community center management. And also there are like the programmatic uh, added value, which is you already have a space who they already have their coordination mechanisms. They already have their dissemination, information dissemination tools. They already have their information collection tools. They have hotline, they have feedback mechanisms. So you can easily jump in and tell them like, I need to have my activities here. It will be much easier to conduct the activities in an accessible place uh, by the beneficiaries and even accessible for people with special needs, with females, with everything. And also it's a secured place because uh, like there are a lot of steps as we mentioned in the beginning, like there's a lot of steps to establish this community center. So instead of you doing your security assessment in the field, doing the coordination, doing the service mapping, everything, there is already a space when you have all of this uh, in a place. And always we are talking about integrated programming, synergizing the programming, synergizing the response. So why you like while you have a place where you have almost all the services or trying to have almost all the services, it's much easier to refer or to have like a share outcomes with other partners and have a, a, like a certain referral pathway, which is much easier for you than going to the field and do it uh, by your own. It's, you will have the support of not just the care management agency who are running the center, you will have also other partners with their databases, with their referral mechanisms, with their work plans, everything. Thanks, Namir. You, you, you convinced me here uh, with your argument. And uh, because I'm a little bit conscious of the time, um, I and, and we haven't really um, addressed, um, you know, what happens when um, community center has been managed. It's running, it's active, it's become this place, um, your place, place where people feel comfortable, but it needs to be handed over. Maybe it has started already very early on, but it's kind of, you know, how, how does that happen? And I know that uh, 16 and Namir, you both have experience from Iraq um, where something like that has happened. You know, how can you get, tell us a little bit about the challenges that one faces when this process starts or progresses? Yes, and there's already a question in the, in the chat about the sustainability. When we are saying the community center, it's it's not uh, any NGO community center. It's a community center. So it's basically for the community and the sustainability of this physical building. It should be like the main focus for the uh, like NGO who are managing these centers. So this community center, you you should have like uh, we you should set it up 
in a, in a, in a, in a quality that it's running perfectly, then you should start for how we're going to sustain it. And then you should start about like consulting the community. Who going to take this, this community center? Who you are trusting to run your community center? You want to run it by yourself. You want to like the government to run it. You want a local NGO to run it. After that, after having this discussion, you can have the findings of the community about who they want like to run this community center. After that, if it's the government, you will start do like an assessment about the government capacity uh, and who gonna take it from the government. Is it the municipality? It's a coordination mechanism conduct like by the government, like in some uh, areas, like there is a, like a coordination uh, body uh, established by the government and they have like the knowledge of the humanitarian response. They will take it. So. And if it's a local NGOs, uh, local NGOs like who who is who are the local NGOs that functioning and have the acceptance from the community, and if it's a community committees, how you gonna uh, like how they can uh, run it and sustain it for a long time, and if it's just community, this also should be uh, like assessed with the community. But talking about all of these bodies, there are two coming things uh, like two common things between like uh, like to hand over to any one of these bodies it's the operational uh, like functions which is they have the capacity in terms of logistics finance uh, they have uh, like uh, a, a grants communication they have media they know how uh, they have a structure they have a policy or not. So this is the first part. You should do a due diligence with them and start to put a plan for a training. And this training should be in line with them. Like, it's not just, I will give the training and I will uh, phase out. It's about giving the training, stay for monitoring and advice for a while, and then you can phase out. And also there is another part, which is the, progr the programmatic part. Uh, did they know how like we are doing the coordination, uh, how we are doing safe referrals, how we are like uh, targeting the people, what's our indi indicator, uh, what's the thing that we should do, like it's the mandatory thing from the program. And this is a different assessment. It should be done with them if they have relevant experience with the communication with the communities, they have relevant experience in coordination. And after that, you should have a list of training and capacity building with those uh, like partners, if it's uh, government, community, local NGO, or a voluntary group. So after having all of this in place, you can stay for a while, deliver this training, work with them in, in the site, which is like what we can what we can say like it's a, a non space training, like you are working with them and as a training, then you can like withdraw but continue with the monitoring and advices, then you can withdraw finally, like from this process. When we are saying this, we are saying it like in a short, like two minutes, but it's a longer process to uh, have the sustainability of these centers in the future. Thanks, Nami, and I can uh, see this is, um, this is a whole discussion in itself, um, exactly. and we, we may should have it. Um, and 16, um, I, I, I want to just quickly give you the floor on that because uh, I know you have similar experience or I don't know similar, but you have similar context experience. Um, and maybe this is a discussion we want to take forward um, in, in separate forum, but please 16. Thanks. Uh, yeah, well, I think Namir covered most of it to be frank. <laughs> that was very comprehensive. <laughs> Thanks, Namir. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, I think in Iraq it was, it, it's a bit hard for me to say because back then I was a camp manager and I was working with my colleagues who were running the center and they're actually in this call. So maybe they can answer in the chat. Uh, they will know a lot more than, than me on this topic. Because for us, as I was saying, we did the handover already. Uh, and because it's very small, the place will be kept used by the community, even if we completely pull out because it's, it's a it's an open one room space so we don't really have this challenge yeah i won't repeat what namir said i think he covered no. the world topic yep perfect well giovanna i think it's time um 
and I hand over to you and uh, for final remarks. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Annika. I would just uh, just before uh, closing, uh, Kristen, if you have uh, really like uh, uh, any thought and reflection, very briefly. Uh, after this uh, session discussing, uh, um, yeah, yeah, all these different things around the management of the centers. Not surprisingly, I do. Um, but it's interesting that it, what some of the main um, points that have come up here, they're also what's been coming up, you know, during this process of collecting and, and um, uh, contextualizing all these tools in the field and testing them out and, and um, putting them together. And um, uh, one of the main points, and I took note of, uh, I mean, many, many people mentioned this in the, in the chat already, Richard and, and Omer um, and others were talking about how, you know, you, you need to consider um, that you're not, you're not starting up in a void. You know, there will be already an existing society um, in this urban non-camp setting, um, existing of private businesses, of public services, of, um, of uh, faith-based and community-based organizations um, you know, and other development organizations as well as humanitarian organizations. So it's a completely different perspective of coordination than what we're used to maybe in a camp. And this really needs to be um, considered and kept in mind um, and how we can support that when you're starting your activities. Um, and uh, the other thing is just to, to be flexible um, um, like Namir was saying with the activities. And uh, uh, I remember discussing this with Henry before about how they're actually looking for specifically for flexible funding so that they can, uh, you know, um, have these participatory consultations and go back and change their, um, uh, their activities accordingly. Um, you know, this, um, uh, referring back to the steps and the faces, you know, you, you might end up jumping between them and back and forth and, and just um, see it as a, as a flexible process. Um, um, and it, it keeps changing and um, it, it would be great to be able to allow it to change. I think that's it, the main okay. points. That... Thanks a lot. Namir, you just had the power cut. Yeah, welcome to Kabul. <laughs> so the, the light all of a sudden disappeared. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Kristin. Um, I'm actually, um, yeah, impressed uh, um, by the amount of experience in this session today. I mean, from uh, um, from all our speakers, uh, uh, Namir, Kristin, Sixteen, uh, Henry, um, and actually, thanks a lot for for join, uh, joining us. Uh, um, but then also, I saw that there was a, a, a lot of discussion ongoing uh, in the chat and uh, people sharing uh, their experience, uh, uh, sharing questions and uh, an opinion. Uh, I mean, I think uh, it was great. Um, from a discussion, uh, I think it came, uh, it was clear that it is really um, important, the contextualization. So we had a very different uh, example of experience of community center. Uh, we uh, saw different type of center based on the context. Um, and uh, this is not, I mean, differences in terms of, uh, you know, the physical space, but then also what is actually happening in these, uh, uh, in these uh, centers. Um, so I think it was uh, very clear how much, uh, you know, we can have, uh, you know, guidance and tools, but then, it's, you know, the, the key of it is uh, contextualizing and uh, contextualizing, listening to, uh, understanding the context, uh, the, 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 the specific context where we are working, like Christine was reminding us, uh, and then putting on the center uh, the people um, and uh, uh, interact with the, uh, um, all the different structures that are existing. So I really like, uh, um, you know, uh, um, 16 was saying the centers belongs to the, the community, Namir said, uh, uh, it's a, a, a people centers. So I really like that we um, highlighted the, in different uh, um, perspective, from different perspectives and regarding uh, different uh, uh, phases of the community center, how it's crucial that the community remain at the centers and, um, 
yeah, this community apps, they, they evolve and they, they develop with them. So that there is not, uh, again, we can have two <coughs> guidance, but then who is guiding the process are the community. Uh, just Giovanna, to, just, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna hurry you because we're, we're three minutes into the break time now. Yeah, I'm, I'm closing now, Charlie. I just wanted to remember that on Monday, if you're interested, there is a, a, a session on, on ABA coordination Christian and Henry will talk about community-led projects, um, and then Christian will do the overview of the community coordination toolbox. Thank you very much. It was a, um, a very good session. Thanks, Giovanna. I'm Thank sorry you. to cut you short. I just saw all the requests for coffee for CCCM <laughs> in the chat. So go and get your coffee. Oh, let's so let's give you 15 minutes. Let's take a 15-minute break, and instead of coming back at quarter two, let's come back at 10:2. So we'll see you at 10 to the hour, whichever hour you're at. Thanks very much. Thank you.